But today, obviously today is Palm Sunday. And today we're going to be taking a step out of our current spot in the book of Matthew. And we're going to be jumping ahead a bit in the story to celebrate the Passion Week together. But before we do that, before we get into the message, I want to tell a story. And this story, it may come as a little bit of a, it's a little bit out of, out of, out of left field, I'll, I'll admit. But I, just trust me, go with me on this. It does all fit in. I do want to tell a story before we jump into the message proper here. One of the things that I picked up from my wife, as some of you may know, she went to art school uh, in Victoria before we met. Uh, and uh, one of the things that I picked up from her is an appreciation, and not in like, not in like a, a, a really like, you know, proud or uh, pretentious way, but a, a, an appreciation for classical literature. <clears throat> and one of my favorite classical stories that she brought into my life, and actually it was during the time when we were dating. She gave me this book, it was a big book, and normally if I saw that book on a shelf, there's no way I would, have eat, I would have read it, but at that point in time, because we were dating, I probably would have eaten a cigarette for her. So I took it and I read it, and it was actually Homer's Odyssey, and it's actually become one of my favorite classical stories that I've ever read. For anyone unfamiliar with the Odyssey, it's an ancient Greek epic poem that tells the story of King Odysseus as he makes his way home after the Trojan War. The story of his journey is filled with disasters and monsters and riddles and narrow escapes and heroic deeds and all that stuff is great. By the time all was said and done with his journey, it took Odysseus 10 years to return from the kingdom of Troy back to his kingdom in Ithaca. While he was on his long and perilous journey, it was believed back in Ithaca that he, that Odysseus and his crew had been lost at sea and would never return. It's been a decade. There's no way this guy is coming back. In his absence, many ambitious men came to his home attempting to convince his wife Penelope to marry them so that they could become king. In the story, none of these men, not one of them, was worthy enough to be Penelope's husband, let alone to be the king of Ithaca. And Penelope managed to, sorry, each and every one of these men, or each and every one of these would-be suitors was lazy, weak, unwise, and cowardly, everything that Odysseus was not. And Penelope, she rejected all of them. She believed that Odysseus was still alive and ret would return home someday. But without a king in Ithaca and with her son unable to take the throne, she could not hold off a successor forever, or at least not without cause. She needed something. The good news was that, like her husband, Penelope was clever, and she thought of a way to keep the men in her home at bay until Odysseus could return. She arranged a challenge for these men. It was a task that she believed only her husband could accomplish, only her husband could succeed at. The test was simple. Whoever could string her husband's war bow and shoot an arrow through the tiny gap left between 12 axes in a row and hit a target on the other side, that man would be her husband and would become the king of Ithaca. No one who attempted the challenge was able to succeed. As a matter of fact, no one was even able to string the bow. And so they just stuck around and waited to see if Penelope's resolve would finally break down and she would just say, fine. One of you, if you can if you can win a thumb wrestling war or something like that, you can be my husband. The resolve didn't break down though. When Odysseus finally did return home, he was able to complete Penelope's challenge, drive the mob out of his home and reclaim the throne. After 20 years, or sorry, for 20 years, Ithaca languished under the incompetent care of unfit and unworthy leaders until the wise, strong, and rightful King Odysseus returned to set things right. 
There are many, many stories across many cultures about kingdoms in ruin where the people wait eagerly for a hero to come and deliver them from their oppression. It seems to be a universal theme that runs across many cultures and across time. And it's actually one of the central themes in Scripture. And it's what we're going to be uh, orbiting around today as we celebrate Palm Sunday together. Now, it's very likely that you've heard the story of Jesus' entry into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, the week before he was crucified. If you haven't heard the story yet, you've been falling asleep in a lot of church services. The triumphal entry is recorded across all four gospel accounts. None of them leave it out. And in each one, it's described as a day of great joy and celebration as the crowds gather around Jesus. As Jesus made his way into the city, riding on this young donkey, the, uh, the people laid down their coats and cut down palm branches and put them on the ground and danced around Jesus in this royal reception for the one who they believed would deliver them from the unworthy uh, rule of their oppressors and restore their nation to its former glory. However, we also know that it's fair to say that the crowd was a little fickle. Their enthusiasm was fickle and misplaced since less than a week later, they would be calling for the crucifixion of the man who they were now hailing as their king, dancing around him saying, Hosanna, Hosanna, glory to God in the highest. Within one week, their tune would change. However, whether they knew it or not, they were still shouting the truth that day. Whether they knew it or not, they were still shouting the truth that day. When Jesus arrived that day, it signaled something significant. When Jesus arrived that day, the reign of the unworthy and unwise was over because the anointed Son of God had come to establish his kingdom. The unworthy shepherds were out because the good shepherd had finally arrived. Now, like I said a moment ago, Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem is recorded on all four Gospels, and it's a key moment in Jesus' story, but each Gospel writer highlights the importance of this event with the same reference back to a prophecy found in the book of Zechariah, and it's where we're going to be, this, where, where we're going to be uh, hanging out this morning. If you have a Bible with you, I would invite you to turn to Zechariah chapter 9. <clears throat> you need some help finding Zechariah, it's the second to last book in the Old Testament. So if you see Matthew, you're not too far away. Zechariah chapter 9, and we'll be focusing on verse 9 together this morning, because that's, that's the verse that's quoted across all four Gospels. I'm going to read it together. It says this, Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. See, your, kingdom comes, or your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Now, as Jesus rode into the city of Jerusalem that day on a young donkey, these are the words, these words right here, these are the words that every person in that crowd, every Jewish person in that crowd would have had screaming through their heads. This, to them, they were seeing this fulfillment of an ancient prophecy that they had waited generations to see. And here it was playing out right before their eyes. Can you imagine the excitement of something like that? But like I said a minute ago, they had a fundamental misunderstanding about what it was that they were seeing, or at least how it was supposed to play out, or even just the significance of what it was they were seeing. They had a picture in their minds, and they may have misunderstood. In order to understand the full weight and glory of what they were seeing as Jesus arrived in the city, we need to travel back about 500 years before that day when Zechariah delivered this message to the people of Israel. Excuse me a moment. Now, 
Now, as you read through the story of the Bible, and I believe that the whole Bible put together is a story. As you read through the story of the Bible, you'll see that in the Old Testament, God set the nation of Israel apart to be his chosen people, which meant that they were to be an example to the nations around them of what a nation that follows God looks like. Now, unfortunately, the people of Israel were ultimately unfaithful to this task. And as he warned them, God handed them over to the kingdoms that they desired to be like. Typically, their unfaithfulness came in the form of wanting to be like the kingdoms around them. And so God would deliver them into the hands of the very kingdoms that they wanted to emulate. The prophet Zechariah lived and worked during the time that King Darius ruled over the Persian Empire. And this this would have been an uncertain time for the people of Israel. The Babylonian Empire before the Persian Empire. The Babylonian Empire, which had been brutally repressive, especially towards the Israelites, had fallen to the Persians. But many people were still scattered in exile all over the place from their homes. That King Darius that we read there, or sorry, never mind, I apologize. So yeah, the people were still scattered in exile from their homeland. The Temple of Solomon had been destroyed, and it had actually been destroyed within the lifetime of some of the people still living in Israel. By the time Zechariah was going and giving his prophetic vision, it had only been about 70 years since the Babylonians had destroyed the Temple of Solomon, sacked it, taken taken a bunch of the stuff or the treasures out of the temple, and taken it with them. Some people hearing Zechariah's message would have remembered that day. The ruins of it, looking at the ruins of the temple, it would have reminded anyone who saw them, or would have made anybody who saw those ruins feel like God no longer dwelled with his chosen people. The Babylonians had made the Israelites suffer greatly, and it was at this time during the Persian occupation that nobody really knew what to expect next. There was a regime change, but we're not sure what the future holds yet could be relief, could be worse. We're not sure yet. Now, on top of the impression that they had experienced and the uncertainty coming from outside of the nation of Israel, there was still internal turmoil going on. There were internal issues happening. The governors in the region, Israel had been broken up into different provinces, and the governors of these little regions... Well, they had all been appointed by foreign rulers for a long time, meaning that the royal line of Israel, David's line, had been replaced by puppet leaders for years. The ones who were supposed to be leading the Israelites in the ways of God's law were unworthy shepherds. And the people were desperately waiting for news that a good shepherd was coming to deliver them from the oppression that they were living under. And it was in this situation, it was in this climate, it was within this historical context that Zechariah's message went out to the remnant still in Jerusalem. Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. And the message here, even just at a, at, a, at a simple glance, the message here is clear. The time of Israel's punishment was going to be over. God was telling his people that the time of their punishment was over and that a good king was on his way. Now, this sounds a lot like one of those classic scenarios that we, may, that we talked about sort of at the beginning. One of those classic scenarios like Odysseus coming home to drive out the unworthy men from his palace. Or maybe something a little bit more familiar to some of us, like, uh, uh, sorry, like King Richard returning to England to reclaim the throne from his brother, Prince John. Or if anybody's familiar with the Lion King. When we think of a hero coming to save the day, we get these romantic images in our mind. And I don't mean romantic like giving flowers or chocolates or anything like that. I mean romanticized. We get these romantic images in our heads of these epic battles 
and that, or an epic battle that ends with a decisive victory where the bad people are run off and the king has won his crown. His right to rule is seen in his victory over his enemies. But there's a difference in this. We can very easily think of this image of this good shepherd, this good king coming in, in one of those kinds of scenarios. We can think of him as coming and battling his way into Jerusalem and winning his way in there. But this vision from Zechariah, it has a unique twist to it compared to that romantic image that we might have. It has this unique twist where instead of a mighty warrior king charging down the hill on a mighty war horse and coming in and winning the city, this king that approaches Jerusalem, this king is humble and riding on a young donkey. To put this in more modern terms, put this in slightly more modern terms, instead of flying... Instead of flying in and descending in a Seahawk helicopter after a whole battle has been won, this is kind of the modern equivalent of riding into town on a moped. (laughs) Sounds silly. It's kind of the way it is. It doesn't sound like a hero that an oppressed group of people might believe that they need, but this king is nonetheless, according to Zechariah, or according to God's revelation to Zechariah, righteous and victorious. It doesn't matter what these people's picture of what they need is. God is still telling them this humble king coming in is still righteous and victorious. And here's what we need to understand about Zechariah or this vision from Zechariah. The people of Israel, like so many people before them, like so many people since then, They had trusted their own strength more than they had trusted God. That's why they were in the situation they were in. Their covenant failure had been to copy the kingdoms around them, to become like them. Instead of obeying God and trusting Him for their provision, they became like the nations around them and abandoned God's law. They wanted the distinction of being influential and powerful, and they wanted to take the credit for their accomplishments. We've earned this. When they were defeated and persecuted, they cried out to God to save them again. But the kind of savior they were looking for still fit the mold of a powerful, uh, a powerful healer who would drive out the oppressors. If you look at the book of Judges, you see that cycle come over and over and over and over again. Everyone did what they thought was right in their own hearts. The people become oppressed. They cry out to God. God gives them a deliverer. That deliverer drives out the Philistines. The people praise God again. And the cycle starts over. The picture that Zechariah gives to the people of Israel is very different from that image that historical cycle. The righteous and victorious king in Zechariah's vision doesn't come to make war. He doesn't even come on a war vehicle or a war horse or a chariot or the thing that you would have expected a victorious hero to come in on. He comes in peace. He's not intimidating or proud. He's humble and lowly. This king does not come to dominate, but he comes to serve. The people did not need a warrior king to save them from their oppressors. That king, much like we've seen throughout the history of Israel, that kind of a king would have led them back to pride. The back on the road to arrogance and pride, and that king would boast about his mighty victory and cause the people to trust in their own strength again. And that cycle had played itself out over and over again through Israel's history. And it was time for something new. If you take a look at verse 10 for a moment, you get to see where some of this difference comes in. So, again, Zechariah chapter 9, verse 10. 
I will take away the chariots of Ephraim and the war horses from Jerusalem, and the battle bow will be broken. So I, God, will take away the chariots from Ephraim and the war horses from Jerusalem, and the battle bow will be broken. He, this king, this coming king, will proclaim peace to the nations. His rule will extend from sea to sea, from the river to the ends of the earth. His rule will extend everywhere. This king is different because he will not pursue victory over his enemies. Instead, this king will trust God to deliver the victory for him. He doesn't need to fight a battle. He trusts that God has already won the battle. You see, in this verse, that it is God who defeats the enemy. It's God who takes away the chariots, or basically at that point in time, the highest military technology in the world breaks it. He takes the war horses out of the city. He breaks the bow. It's God who does these things. It's not God who enables somebody to do these things. God himself does it. It's not a promise of strength to overcome the enemy. It is God who wins the victory. This coming king will proclaim the peace that God has run, has already won and rule with the authority that God has handed over to him from his victory. This humble king will lead the people in true devotion to God, completely absent of pride. This king will proclaim the peace that God has won. And this king will lead the people in true devotion because he will not rely on his own strength. He will rely on the strength of God. The shepherds of the past led the people in a cycle of repentance, forgetting, falling away, and then punishment that drove them back to repentance. The time of the old unfit shepherds who led the people in this cycle of ruin will be over when this good shepherd arrives. Zechariah's vision spoke of a hope for the people that went beyond nationalistic aspirations. It went beyond even praying for the strength to overcome an enemy. Now to be sure, God was promising to deliver the people from their oppressors and bring them into a day that where there would be no more sorrow and no more pain. That is true. The promise of a good king to lead the people was very real. But the greater implications of this prophecy came to pass when Jesus entered the city of Jer Jerusalem in that day over 400 years after. He did not come in proclaiming his greatness. He did not come to conquer. He rode in on a little donkey to offer himself on behalf of every person in history. He came to lead the people in humble devotion to God, and he did not demand the fanfare because, like the fanfare that he, he received, he did not demand it. He didn't demand it because he came in obedience to the Father. As the ultimate example of love and devotion. And because of this, Jesus truly was and is the king of Zechariah's vision. And he entered the city that day in the righteous victory that God was going that he knew that God was going to provide him. For us, as we enter into this Passion Week, this is where it all starts. We celebrate Palm Sunday along with those people who celebrated Jesus' entry into the city of Jerusalem 2,000 years ago. But as we celebrate Jesus' victory over the enemy, let's be sure to remember the kind of king that we serve. Jesus had emptied himself of everything 
to be totally reliant on his father. He did not ride in claiming victory for himself. He trusted God for the victory. As we approach the cross along with Jesus this week, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> as we approach the cross along with Jesus this week, it is so important to remember that victory over sin and death did not come from any work that we do. If we trust our own righteousness, we will be in the same cycle as the people of Israel were in. If we continue to trust in our own strength or follow the, 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 the people that we may venerate, we will be in that same cycle as the people of Israel. Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. See your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, on the foal of a donkey. There is no goodness that you or I can cling to and no shepherd that we can trust who can lead us into victory apart from God. The good news of Palm Sunday is that the cycle of sin and death is finally over because the good shepherd has come to lead us in true devotion to God. With that in mind, we're going to continue to glorify and celebrate the King together. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, as we remember who you are, as we remember the kind of example that you have given us, as we remember the life and the ministry that you lived out, Lord God, never allow us to lose sight of the fact that Without you, without total reliance on you, without total deliverance from you, God, we are lost. That there is no strength, there is no one that we can cling to aside from you. Jesus, we thank you for being that humble king who entered in and ushered in a new era for us to live in. That the old way is completely gone and that the good shepherd is here to lead us in true devotion to God. We pray, Lord, that you would reveal to us better day by day how to live like you. That, God, you would continue to conform us to your image. That we would never lose sight of the service and the sacrifice that you made So that, God, we could be reconciled to you and so that, God, we would have a good shepherd to follow. Pray it now, God, in your name. Amen.